This podcast contains potentially sensitive topics, including strong language, drug abuse, and other conditions of human suffering. Listener discretion is advised. Can you can we start by telling why we don't have the ten or so minutes that we already reported? Sure, sure, sure. We can start by that. Why is that? Why do we not have that? Because you're an idiot. No, <laughs> you just wanted me to say that, didn't you? <laughs> you just think that's just the greatest thing, huh? Because I am. <laughs> Missed some really great stuff. Probably the best part of this whole interview. Probably would have made made this podcast actually worth listening to, but it's like all the rest of them so far now. So you might as well just change the channel. It could have been. It could have been something. Okay, let's start over. I'm Rex Holbein, and welcome to You Know Me Now a podcast conversation that strives to amplify the unheard voices in our community. I want to remind all of our listeners that the folks who share here do so with a great deal of vulnerability and courage. They share a common hope that by giving all of us a window into their world, they will be opening for us an increased level of awareness, understanding, and connection within our own community. The issue of homelessness is extremely complex for everyone. As citizens, knowing how to respond to solutions put forward by government and nonprofits is at best difficult. It often requires a deeper understanding of the issue than most of us have. Even more overwhelming can be knowing how to respond personally when our own life path crosses with someone who is experiencing homelessness. In these moments, We often struggle with what the right thing to do is. And while there are many ways to engage, to be of service to those in need, often what is overlooked is the significance of simple human connection, of just listening and being there. What does becoming a friend with someone experiencing homelessness look like? In this episode, we're going to be talking with Michael Holmes, also known by his stage name, Dizzy Lee Roth. Hey, Dizzy, good to see you. Hey, Rex, it's great to see you as always. Dizzy has a gecko tattoo above his right eye. It crawls right through and out of his eyebrow. Dizzy has his old band name tattooed across both butt cheeks, and he's happy to show it to you if you care to ask. Dizzy is smart. I would say really smart. Dizzy is a musician. He formed and played in a number of well-known Seattle bands, mostly in the 1990s. Dizzy is funny. Dizzy is friendly and quick to laugh, even when times are tough. Dizzy is addicted to heroin. Dizzy busks for his money. Dizzy is homeless. Dizzy is my friend. Dizzy and I met eight years ago at Gasworks Park. He was living there in a tent. And today, Dizzy lives in a shipping container located in a working industrial yard along the Ship Canal in Seattle. His container, or I should say his home, is stacked on top of several other containers. He has electricity, but no indoor plumbing, and there are no windows in his container. To get to his place, you come through a locked chain link fence climb a flight of wooden open stairs to the top of a container, which is completely littered with construction supplies and bags of garbage. And by the way, there is no railing. Um, You make your way from there to the other side, cross a 15 inch gap to the top of another container before walking 12 feet or so to Dizzy's sliding metal front door. If you turn around, you get a most stunningly beautiful view of the Ballard Bridge and the Ship Canal. Dizzy's space is a total mess. And while it's his mess, it does bother him, I would say immensely. When I visit, he quickly apologizes and cleans off a spot for me to sit. I personally don't mind the mess, and I tell him to please stop apologizing. It is sensory overload, though. The walls are covered with graffiti and the floor with all his stuff. A half-size refrigerator, propane tanks, uh, end tables, lamps, a chair, garbage, and more. The place is is full. Half-eaten food can be found on a good deal of the horizontal surfaces. 
Oh, and musical equipment. About seven guitars, a number of amps, and other digital musical equipment is strewn around. When I walked in today, I stepped over a clarinet just inside the door. All of that said, I really love his place. It's him. It's Dizzy. And it's much, much better than the broken down minivan he was living in just a few months ago and the years of tents before that. Now, to understand just a little of who Dizzy is, let's first go back in time and hear about his childhood. Okay, so yeah, I was born, I was born in La Mesa, California. It's uh, in San Diego County. Uh, we lived in El Cajon, which is right next to La Mesa. Um, my dad worked at nights. Um, he uh, he drank. He'd always drank, you know, and uh, neglecting my mom, I, I, I would say. And so she started having an affair. Uh, like many people, I have both a dad and a father. My dad, his name is Lowell Holmes. He was married to my mother, uh, uh, Carol. Uh, but he did not. Uh, inseminate her with the demon seed that became me. Uh, that was done by a man named uh, Bob McGrail. The family long suspected that Dizzy's mother was having an affair. Often, she would leave him and his sisters at home alone, sometimes all night, as their dad, at that time, was working the graveyard shift. At which point, my dad's sister, my Aunt uh, Betty, um, had, a, had a private detective follow my mom because they, they knew she was having an affair. And uh, she wanted her to have her declared an unfit mother, and so, and that's what happened. And so my dad got custody of us. So, but anyway, so my, my, that was all documented. So in court, my mom lost custody, my dad got custody. It was unusual in the 60s for a father to get sole custody. Since his dad was working, he relied on his sister Betty to take care of the kids. So my dad would usually uh, rouse the three of us up at around uh, 4.35 in the morning. Drop us off at my aunt's house. Uh, well, he would go to work because she was a, uh, a homemaker back in the 60s when, when women still did that. Uh, in a, in a, like most women did that. My dad worked either at Convair or General Dynamics. Uh, Convair being a subsidiary of General Dynamics. A defense contractor, by the way. Um, there in San Diego. And uh, my uncle was an executive at General Dynamics. A uh, little side note. uh Due to my dad's drinking problem, he lost his job several times. Due to his brother-in-law being uh, one of the top executives at General Dynamics, he got his job back several times. That's just more of how my dad was kind of spoiled, you know? Like, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd fuck up and he'd get his job back, you know, because of connections. Yeah, when he'd come home from, uh, pick us up from work, he'd very often stop at the bar on the way home and leave us kids in the car. Because that's what he did, basically. He had, he had a serious alcohol problem, you know, that, that uh, ruled his life. You know, yeah, far more than he he suffered um, alcoholism. Dizzy's dad would leave him and his two older sisters in the car for two, three, sometimes eight hours at a time, while he was in the bar drinking. As kids, they didn't think much of it. It was just what it was. Luckily, Dizzy's aunt Betty was a good and caring person who did try her best to provide a stable home. It was not always easy. Dizzy admits he was difficult on his aunt. Just sharing about it makes him tear up. I started going to school around five, like most kids do. I went to kindergarten. And before that, I uh, usually spent the days, uh, I, I, not usually, but I spent the day, the weekdays with my aunt. My sisters were in school, and I would stay with my aunt during the day. You know, she said I was a pretty good kid, you know. But one time, they did give me a little toolkit, and... uh the screws for the doorknobs were right about eye height for me. And so while she was watching her stories, they called it back then, soap operas, I took all the doorknobs up the inside of the house <laughs> and she couldn't get out. <laughs> and she, so she was a homemaker. She didn't know how to put that shit back together. She, she could not get out of the house. So I start, um, I, I start school and, uh, uh, like second or third day, they're like, we need a parent teacher conference. This kid is a fucking hellion, you know, that's like totally out of control, totally disrupting class, you know, totally just all, doing all, what I wanted, you know. All the doorknobs are gone. All the doorknobs are gone out of school. Yeah. That's when they, so they took me to the doctor and of course decided I was hyperactive and put me on Ritalin at the age of five. From uh, kindergarten to third grade, I went through a, um, a succession of uh, 
more potent and harder to get uh, amphetamines and methamphetamines. I went from, I believe, Ritalin to uh, Benzedrine to uh, Preludin, which I'm not sure if that's dextroamphetamine sulfide or, or methamphetamine, uh, to uh, uh, Dexedrine, which is methamphetamine, and then Dezoxin. By the time I was in fourth grade, they had me on Dezoxin, which, I mean, that's 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 good shit. As far as speed goes, you can't really get this option anymore. Um, those pills didn't really help. They did not, you know, I was still pretty out of control, you know, but they kept feeding them to me anyway. And then at, at some point in the fourth grade, they had switched me to phenobarbital. I asked Dizzy what it was like for him in school, being hyperactive. From the time I was in uh, kindergarten, they would always put me in mixed classes. So when I, 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 when I was in kindergarten, they put me in a class with... Uh, a couple other kids where we were actually in with, with first graders, and in first grade I was in with the same same group of kids. We actually went to the second grade class. Yeah, they were moving. So we kind of skipped kindergarten, you know, because uh, you know, uh, at that time drawing pictures of crayons with crayons wasn't, you know, like when I one day my aunt picked me up from school on the way home. Just nostalgia does this to me sometimes. Uh, I told her which trees were deciduous and which ones were evergreen. Because I learned that that day. Another day she picked me up and I described the Coriolis spec to her. So drawing stuff with crayons wasn't uh, cutting it, you know, for me and a couple other kids, you know. And so they moved us up. Though I was, I guess, smart and, and, and very aware of certain things in, a, in, a, in a, another sense, either due to the medication or the hyperactivity, I was also very oblivious to a lot, you know. You're in your own world. Kind of. I think a lot of times it came up as rude, you know? You know, I mean, we'd just be like, you know, who's this horrible child? When talking with Dizzy, he freely shares about unresolved issues from his childhood and how those emotions heavily inform his interactions today, such as how feelings of abandonment work their way into his present-day relationships. He also knows he was fortunate to have his Aunt Betty fill in as a surrogate mother and his uncle as a positive male figure in his life. Oh, my uncle used to take me up in a Cessna plane when I was a little kid, and that was pretty special. I'll never forget that, you know, and just how cool that was, him being such a uh, quiet, stoic sort of a uh, guy and just just annoying little kid. But he knew that, you know, I'm sure he probably saw my eyes light up and thought, oh, yeah, I'm taking him. Dude, I was so hyperactive. I, I mean, I can, I, I, I can kind of remember... Being on the tarmac with him and just jumping up and down, yelling "plane, plane, plane," you know. And he didn't go shut up. So that happened more than once. Oh yeah, it was something we do every other weekend or so. We go to Gillespie Field there in El Cajon and uh, eat breakfast at the little restaurant there, and then uh, go out and fire the plane up, take off, go out over Catalina Island and look down and see gray whales and all this other cool stuff. Wow, sounds beautiful. And then once in a while, he'd say, "Do you want to try to fly the plane?" And so he'd let go of the wheel, and after about one second, he'd go, because I would, you know, I'd like go, I'd pull on it and turn it, and the plane's starting to go, Row. you can't really do that in a Cessna. <laughs> yeah. But he'd try, you know? He let, it sounds like he let you be you. He tried, but like I say, he was very stoic. He didn't have a whole lot of time for me, you know, I wasn't his kid, you know, but yeah, when he was kind, he was really kind. Yeah. In retrospect, I kind of wish I'd been a little closer to my aunt and uncle, you know? You know, natural childhood rebellion uh, has its good points and has its bad points, you know. You know, and my aunt and uncle, they're getting older, too, because they're older than my dad, you know. They're, they're, they already raised their kids, and their kids went off to college and had successful lives. They didn't really, you know, especially my uncle, I'm thinking, they really didn't need a, a, a high school kid to, you know, do all that shit you got to do with a high school kid, you know. You know, they, they, they were by no means neglectful. Maybe because I got shuffled back and forth between my dad and my aunt and uncle and stuff. Uh, a real super close bond. I mean, I mean a super close bond, like where you really trust this person. Uh, never really formed. I don't want to make excuses for anything too, but I think a lot of it has to do with why I spent so long homeless, why I have a hard time being employed. You know, I'm not an idiot. I have skills. I like to work. Uh, it's kind of a vicious cycle that feeds on itself too, you know. You know, they say that a lot of people, oh, they think the world owes them. Well, I kind of feel that my fucking world sort of owes me those sometimes, you know? But at the same time, I'm not an idiot. I, 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 
I know how to pick myself up. For Dizzy, school was difficult. Not because he wasn't smart, actually far from it, but because his ADHD was not allowing him to excel in the structured school setting, despite all the medications he was on. Often, he was seen as a troublemaker. In fact, Dizzy saw himself that way, too. It wasn't due to a mean or bad streak within him, but rather due to his overactive mind. It kept him from settling down and fitting in. As Dizzy grew older, he found community, or perhaps I should say his chosen family, through friendships. Those friendships were gathering around the one thing Dizzy really cared about and was good at, and that was music. My uncle had this uh, this Gibson guitar that he kept in the closet, you know, and it was a Gibson. It was a nice guitar, you know. It wasn't for such, but I would sneak in there anyway, and I would just pluck the string, just get it open enough to where I could pluck the strings to it and uh, uh, sit there and do that until I got caught. Uh, and then they got me one in when I was in second grade when I was seven years old. And uh, I pretty much took to it and played it all the time. I wish I'd been playing more country music back then because I think my uncle would have seen it and, and maybe been more jazzed about when you're in high school, your music that you listen to means so much to you and you're so opinionated about it and it, it, it's so representative of who you are and any other kind of music, especially your parents' music, is, 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 is you're against that, you know? You know, now and later in life, I, I just got really sprung on it, you know? And if, I think if I got sprung on it back then, I probably maybe, you know, would have had a shot at getting a decent guitar. But yeah, I'm uh, uh, playing along the records in my room, you know? Uh, did a little jamming with some other people, but nothing, nothing too serious, you know? During Dizzy's formative years in Southern California, the lack of direction and guidance from adults in his life started to show up in ways that were destructive for him. His behavior had long-term damaging effects on his relationships. To this day, he regrets some of the things he did during those years. You know, because, I mean, this is how it goes. When you, have older si- when you have older siblings, when you're young, they beat you up because they're bigger than you. When you get older, you beat them up because you get bigger than them. It's payback time. So there was that, and, and it was nothing super violent. Though at one point, you know, I, I did, I remember I chased, one, I chased one or both of my sisters around the house with a knife once. In my mind and in my heart, I didn't picture me catching them and stabbing them. I pictured uh, them being terrified of me, you know? Uh, how old were you when huh? you had, well how old were you when you had that knife chasing them oh like 15 16 yeah yeah I was, I was a young man did you have any run-ins with the law before coming to Washington uh yeah a couple I got caught shoplifting at a uh, at the mall there in El Cajon like 13 or something and I said to the cop you probably not so tough without that badge you know and he took me outside and I'm like you know I didn't I go so what's gonna happen he goes you're trying to escape. And then next thing I know, I, I woke up, you know, I was getting put in the car. But yeah, so he took me down and, and I think he put a sleeper on me and threw me around a little bit. I had to, ended up with this scar. Put, right a, what on, put a what on you? A sleeper hold. Oh. Yeah, like the kind that they killed that guy at that yeah, cigarette choke, cellar in New York. Choke hold type thing. Yeah. When I was um, in like eighth grade, I, uh, I, uh, I called McDonald's with a bomb threat. And I told him I wanted fifty thousand dollars and to drop it off at this at this at my school, you know. And then I went and walked around the school, and there was my principal. And this is on a weekend, and I'm not putting any of this together. I'm like, hey, Mister Metz, and he's walking with some guy who was a detective. And it took them about three seconds for me to be crying. Yes, I did it. And so uh, they charged me with extortion. You know, kids playing a prank on on the, uh, you know, I mean, I was so young that they said a woman called. You know, because it sounded, I, yeah, your voice you know, it sounded so like high. a girl's voice. Yeah, they they said it was some woman that made the bomb threat. Um, so yeah, they charged me with extortion. I went to juvenile hall for that. I want to stop and reflect on this moment in Dizzy's childhood. People often ask, "How does someone fall into homelessness? Is it really that we are all just two paychecks away from it, waiting for a crisis to come into our lives?" Yes, sometimes. That is exactly it. But most of the time, the reasons for homelessness are much more complex than just that. Often it begins early in childhood where a path is being set. Generational poverty, 
poor foster care, mental health issues such as the many forms of trauma, uh, systemic barriers such as racism, all of these and more can knock children off their path of developing a strong self-esteem and the needed life skills to live a healthy, productive life. Almost all kids are mischievous, looking to test the edges. Actually calling in a bomb threat as a plan for getting money is a completely different thing. When hearing the path of Dizzy's childhood, it becomes easier to understand how he got to the point of making that call, and further, how that experience of going to Juvenile Hall joined the list of other experiences that are all connected to his homelessness. I wish that, 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 that at some point one of them could have said, you know, do you ever do you ever look at yourself and wonder, you know, what am I going to do? Not necessarily what are you going to be or anything, but, you know, if I was so smart, why didn't they talk to me more adult-like, you know? You know, I don't, and I, it's, it's, it, I don't fault them for it. I'm sure they did the best they knew how. I don't know. One thing that I, I, I actually kind of resent is um, their absolute failure to see that no matter what, I was going to be a musician. And they, uh, you know, if they'd have nurtured that, for better or for worse, if they'd have nurtured that, I'm pretty sure, not necessarily that I would be a star or anything, but I do have a bit of a gift from God. And I think a lot of times with something like that, it, you know, they were always about, well, you know, you, you've got to have something to fall back on, you know. And they, it's like, I don't know why they didn't see, you know, this this kid is seven years old and he's playing and singing songs, you know, uh, correctly, uh, pretty good, you know. This is what he's going to do. This is his talent. Let's nurture it. They were totally, like, against it, you know. It's a little bit hard for me to see the good stuff, you know, because, I, you know, my life being what it is, you know, I have to look back and go, you know, where did I go wrong, you know? And so I just see parts of my childhood where I was just so uninformed, you know, and then and then I do tend to blame that a little bit on the people that raised me. It's like, God, you know, I wish somebody would have sat me down and told me how bucked up the world is because I know they knew, you know, and it's not like they tried to paint a picture that the world was a great rosy place. They just never bothered either way that, you know, I mean, somebody needs to sit down with a young person and... and you know, with a, in a non-judgmental way, find out where they're going, what they're doing, and if they care about them, help them out with that. All they told me about, this, you know, the, the truth of the world is that I had a one in a zillion chance of making it as a musician. I should find something to fall back on, which I resent, you know. A, a bit. I mean, there is truth to it, but every uh, interview with, like, a, a, a musician that I hear that may, they sound like me when they're a child, you know, I was totally in, engulfed with music, you know. I, I mean, they sound like what... But like me, you know. Only they were, you know, their parent was cool and bought them a guitar or a drum set or what fucking they ever, you know. And the ones you hear about. Yeah. Well, the rest of them are probably like me. You know? Well, but you take my uncle for example. He wanted to be a musician when he was younger too, and he gave it up. And he must have been pretty good because he picked up the trombone again after he retired. And after a few years, he was pretty he had some soul you know besides dizzy's love for music there has been another defining constant in his life and that is drugs beginning in early childhood doctors prescribed various and ever increasingly potent medications for his adhd including barbiturates at the age of nine these early prescribed drugs transitioned for dizzy to recreational drugs as he grew older other than times spent in jail, Dizzy has been medicated his entire life. He will tell you it is difficult for him to know who he is when unmedicated. In California, you can kind of play in the sewers, you know, because it's warm and it's, uh, they have sewers that are just run off water. They're not, they don't have shit in them, you know. Uh, and we would play in the sewers a lot. <laughs> yeah, so we would play in this, these huge storm drains and stuff. There were ones big enough to ride your bike in. And we had this tree fort. And then these older kids would come to the tree fort and they would smoke pot and leave roaches. So we started picking up these roaches and smoking them. You know? And so that's basically when I started smoking pot. I was getting in trouble. I was getting in trouble. My dad couldn't do it. So you know? did, did your sisters also go to your aunt or was it no, just, just, just you? No, just me. Yeah. Yeah. They were handling it. They were going to school and getting grades. I was... Addiction and getting loaded. Yeah. yeah. 
was your aunt a, a huggy, nurture, kind of kind, kind of emotional woman that way? Like she could connect with you? Uh, or was she just doing a good house? house? She, uh, she deserved better than she got from me. As Dizzy reached high school, with no real mentorship around him, he was freely experimenting with alcohol and other drugs. Yeah, just kind of weed and, and booze and things that uh, junior high, bad junior high kids or, you know, elementary kids get into, you know. It was kind of, I wanted to be cool and hip, you know, and it was just falling out of the hippie era into the 70s era, you know. Basically ready to try anything. I used to steal my aunt's Valium, her 10 milligram Valium. You know, I didn't realize it back then at all that, like, taking six of the 10 milligram volume was, volume was a hell of a lot of volume. I would never do that now. I would never do that. But I used to do, I used to take like six of them and go to a kegger twice or two or maybe three times when I've, when I've taken a, a good amount of volume. I've, uh, I've got my nose broke. I'd find a big dude and, yeah, and just fuck with him until he fucking beat me up. You know, I'd fuck with him until he beat me up. Three times, so that's whatever action or attitude goes along with that is how it would make me act. And uh, one time I took uh, six blue volume and went to a, a kegger with two dollars in my hand for a keg cup. And I woke up and I had a 10 speed and a half ounce of tie stick and like 250 bucks. Clue as to where it came from. I think I vaguely remember stealing the bike. So then it totally so, clueless. So then from volume. You you also had speed enter into the picture, and yeah, at some, well at some point you know it was just uh, well um, uh, started doing uh, snorting a lot of speed with my my buddy Tim from high school. You know we were close friends. We were like the same music stuff. We he had a camper outside of his parents' house in the yard. You know, so we would kind of get away from the, the parents and and hang out there. His parents were pretty cool anyway. They didn't care if we smoked pot or whatever. Dizzy's drug use was spiraling out of control. He was bouncing around, living with his mother, father, and couch surfing. During this time, his uncle and aunt retired and moved to North Bend, Washington, which is a small community located east of Seattle in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. At one point, Dizzy reached out to his aunt and uncle and decided to come stay with them as he needed to get away from Southern California. Knew that what I was doing in California was bad, you know? to do that much uh, speed. Um, Did, can I ask, coming here, was it was it an effort to change that? It was an effort to change a couple of things. Uh, the girl I'd been seeing had cheated on me with a friend of mine, and I was kind of stalking her with uh, really bad intentions in my mind. You know, you know, uh, I was pretty young, you know, but I was kind of telling myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to kill her, you know. I don't know if I would have, but I, 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 I left. I got away. So like, I mean, it was the first time I ever loved and she just totally betrayed me, dude. I was, I could not fathom that two people could be in love, be lovers, be this close, make promises to one another, and one of them just not mean it. She was like, I was like 18 and she was 27. I always viewed it as like a fucking sacred, magical thing, the way it's supposed to be viewed, you know? The, the, the fairy tale that's supposed to happen, you know? You yeah, know? you were you were doing you wanted to do some harm, whether you would have or not. I I, I did I, I did you know, and so I left. I don't really. It's weird. I don't like talking about that because uh, should I uh, stay down there and follow through or something, I would be uh, a, a totally different person. I would I would have, you know if I went to prison for something like that, I would be labeled that, and um, I would be that. Dizzy arrives in the Seattle area around 1988 and lives with his aunt and uncle, who are now older and retired, and quite frankly, are not too excited to have him there. His life is revolving around working odd jobs, friends, music, and drugs. I got a job at a cabinet company, A.E. Downs Custom Cabinetry. And uh, while there, I met this guy, Marvin, who also played guitar. Because uh, I guess musicians, we're just kind of attracted to each other somehow. We find each other in places. And so I started hanging out with Marvin, and we put together a band called Crypt. And uh, there was a, also a local drummer, Donnie, uh, who was in the band with us. Our, our bass player, Ted, lived out in Kirkland. And so I had that band for a few years, and uh, that band kind of split up, and uh, 
didn't really go anywhere with that band. Kind of, uh, we made a recording, made little recordings with, with all the bands. They were kind of, eh, you know, they were all right. And um, then I, I, I answered an ad to, to, to be in a uh, top 40 uh, duo, just me and another guy, and a computer uh, traveled around the country and played music, uh, cover songs in bars. Um, and that was a pretty good experience. You know, we, we had like a, a two-hour set that we'd play twice a night. So when you're doing that um, every, like say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometimes the Sunday or the Wednesday we get thrown in there too, your chops get pretty good pretty fast because, you know, it's your practicing like four hours a night, every night, uh, playing and singing. And uh, like, like I sang, sang 80% of the material in that band, at least. And then, uh, then we finally took it from a duo. I got John, Donnie to join that band, and then we got another guitarist and bass player, and we had a five-piece um, doing basically the same song that they sounded a lot better. And then, so Donnie, uh, um, he had this, him and, uh, uh, he, he ended up joining this glam band, and he had, him and uh, somebody else from out North Bend had an apartment on Capitol Hill, the one right next to uh, City Market. It used to be Maelstrom's. Do you remember that? There's an apartment building right next to that. It's one of the sleaziest ones on Capitol Hill. We lived there. And and the, and the place was super cheap too, and there was like five or six of us living there. So, come rent time, you know, it was come up with fifty bucks, you know, you know, and and young and full of energy and lifestyle. I didn't care if slept on the floor, you know. It was nothing. It was great, you know. It was great. We were having a good time, you know. And are you making? I know you've said you don't make money doing that, but were you making money? Or is, I mean, were you? I was making a little money at that time. A lot of times, I would uh, drink up my check. You know, because uh, it was at, at bars, and I was, you know, I was having a great time. You know, I was just getting drunk, and so like at the end of the week when he would do out the check, you know, he he explained the expenses to us, uh, Gene, what our leader, and he go, okay, so fifteen percent came off the top to the agent, that's that, um, and then he'd get to each individual, you know, and he'd go, uh, you know, uh, 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 Donnie, your your uh, what you made was this, your bar tab was this, and then ten uh, percent for gas. And this is what you left with. And then he would get to mine, and he would say it all, and then he'd go, and you owe the band. <laughs> so I wouldn't have any money going in my pocket. I would owe the band of the next check. So um, when I got home from that, it was it was like it was like getting out of prison. I mean, I, I had nowhere to live. I didn't I really know anybody because I'd been gone for a year. And uh, I called my aunt and uncle again, you know, and said, you know, I promise you I'll get a job right away, which I did. I got a job at McDonald's. Uh, you know, I was by that time I was like 27, 28. You know, they wanted me to cut my hair and become management, and I was like, no, 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 no. And I do not regret that. You weren't going to climb the McDonald ladder? No, I was not going to climb the McDonald. I was not going to climb the Mc ladder <laughs> the to the Mc office. <laughs> After that, uh, ran into Donnie again. I mean, me and Donnie we were pretty tight through the whole music thing for like at least you know 10, 15 years or something, and I uh, moved to downtown Seattle. Um, and I got a job at the off ramp, uh, being a bar back and busting tables and stuff. Uh, just played around a bit then, and then I got to. Uh, um, well, I, I knew a guy who uh, who swept from Arizona, and his whole band had quit and went home to Arizona. And so I joined up with him, and we toured around playing original music for uh, well, maybe six months or something. That was really fun. It's totally different than Top Forty. The Top Forty, you know, they they had accommodations for you, and all, and then. The DIY tours, you know, we we try to get accommodations at somebody's house, but or we camp, you know, and that was more fun. I didn't really make any money at that either, but also had a great time. And then eventually, uh, eventually formed this band Zeke with Donnie. That um, when we made a recording with that band, I mean, like all the other bands, I'd make recordings with, and be like, oh yeah, you know that that sounds pretty good, you know, you're telling yourself. But then when we made a recording with uh, Zeke, it was just like. Oh man, now I know all that other stuff. When I was telling myself it's kind of okay, it was because it was crap, you know, because this kicks ass. Like when you uh, when you finally with a girl who you know loves you, I mean, then you know all those other times when you kind of had doubts in your gut that just because they didn't love you, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the real thing, and this was the real thing. And were I, you and were you guys getting attention? Oh, yeah, yeah, we were getting attention. Right, right around the time the attention got big, of course, when I quit. <laughs> and then I joined another band called Shark Chum, and we did all right, too, you know? Did you have Did you have personal goals that this was going to really go somewhere? Was that Was that the hype at, at those two bands for you? For, you, for your music kind of aspirations? Well, not for my aspirations, but for as far as 
what I got done, I think so, uh, up to this point, yeah. And then what happened? What, after Chark Shum? Oh, well, the whole time I was, it was, I was, uh, I was dividing myself up between, uh, drugs and music and, and, uh, you know, of course, drugs won out because, you know, addiction is cunning, baffling, and powerful and wants to kill me. It is easy to miss how important Dizzy's talents contributed to the late 80s and early 90s developing Pacific Northwest music scene. Heckler Magazine had this to say about Zeke, quote, Welcome the new monsters of rock. It's no doubt true that West Coast punk thrasher Zeke are monsters. Ever since their first gig at the Rock City in Seattle in 1993, People have had no choice but to pay attention. Their records will assault you, and their live shows will batter you. Zeke established a nasty disposition while cutting teeth on their own brash hardcore punk. All Music Magazine said, quote, A punishing American hardcore unit based out of Seattle, Washington, Zeke's gatling gun riffing and bluesy hard rock demeanor draw as much from heavy metal, particularly speed and thrash, as punk splitting the difference between Motorhead and Black Flag. Dizzy seems a little more bashful about Zeke. I wasn't really in the middle of it, you know? Um, Kind of on the edge of it, kind of... But we were, um, we're different than the rest of the scene. We weren't really in the scene. I mean, a lot of the bands that were in the scene liked us, you know? We were like one of Eddie Vedder's favorite bands at one time. Really? So, so, so he says, you know. Um, That's a big thing. I know, I guess. I mean, you know. Mark used to say, oh, you're just doing that to get punk rock brownie points. <laughs> and I didn't think it was, I didn't think he was doing it to get punk rock brownie points. I figured he liked the band. Why wouldn't he like the band? I mean, it's, it's good music. In the more recent years, Dizzy has been trying to get by financially by busking on Seattle streets. He has a simple setup and a small amp and guitar that he takes with him to grocery stores and other venues where he can set up and play for people. I've just played less over the past few years. I haven't really had anything going on. Um, I've been busking every day, but busking is a... Right now, as far as rock and roll goes, I'm really out of shape. I'm really out of shape. My my finger dexterity is way, way behind and diminished. My, my picking hand strength, accuracy, and uh, dexterity and finesse is way back. That's why I, I, I took my practice regime, well, I started a practice regime again, but I, I've gone back about 30 years. You know, I'll get back up to here. It won't take me 30 years to get back up to where I was, you know, but I, I need to practice relatively intently for another, like, three or four months to be um, maybe just, if I went out and auditioned for a band now, probably probably wouldn't make it you know I mean there's some people that would hire me to be you know hire uh, like if he's getting paid but hire me to be in their band just because I was in Z because of who I am you know yeah. and what uh, you could get back to yeah and and I, I still have a tiny bit of pull here and there you know I, I'm still connected you know so why do you why do you suppose uh, you've slid drugs mm. has your use gone up nope well, like I say, when do you ever see me fucked up? Never. I'm a little bit fucked up today. But slightly. I didn't know if you were noticing me, but I was kind of closing my eyes a little earlier. You know? Nope, I didn't see it. <laughs> if you're if you're not fucked up, but you're you're saying drugs, you've been you've been playing and practicing through all these years with taking drugs. Yeah. Is it, is it catching up with you, or what's... it's 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 it has a tendency to, and is stealing a little bit of the fire in my belly, you know. But I'm, I'm trying to handle that. And, uh, you know, this is another reason why I got to quit. You know, I got to quit. That was what I was going to ask you is, do you go through these cycles where you feel like it's it's uh, it's kind of like getting the better of you so you go through an effort to quit? Is that when I see you? Because I've been through a f- few cycles with you when you've said you're, you're quitting. You've made the effort. And it's taking up too much of my life and my money, you know? I mean, I can afford it, but I can't afford anything else. Um, uh I play guitar, but I'm not excelling on guitar. It's 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 stifled me. You know, I know, and I've known for a while that drugs will take away from me 
everything that I love. Whether it's because that's that's the job of my addiction is to destroy me and kill me. You know, that's what everybody's addiction wants of them is their life. And uh, uh, you know, that's why they say it. Na and na, it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. We beg of you. They say, you know, be honest and thorough from the beginning. I asked Izzy why there seems to be such a strong correlation between artists and drug use. I think a lot of creative people come from a similar type of, uh, or a similar type of makeup. You know, they say suffering makes good art, you know. And then uh, you make good art, you know, society says, suffer more, suffer more, please. Illustrated by the Oscar Wilde poem, uh, The Rose and the Nightingale. I, I want to hear you talk a little bit about like your own self-reflection on why are, why, why are you living in a, in a, why are you here now? Like, why are you in this container? Or why, are, why did your life move to this point? What do you think the contributing factors are? Well, as far as the negative parts of it, of course, it was drugs. You know, I mean, I can blame uh, everything on, on everything, you know, and there's, there's a little bit of truth to that, but eventually, you know, I have to, I'm a grown-up. I have to accept responsibility for what I've done, you know. I mean, there, we all have choices, and I've made some wrong choices, you know. Do you think it's that, it's that simple? It's just wrong choices? Like, do you remember those moments? Like, oh, fuck. I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have... Some of them, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm alive, you know. I know a lot of guys have made it in music that aren't alive because of it. I don't think I was really mature enough to strike fame and fortune. I really don't think I was mature enough. It probably might have saved my life, the fact that I, you know, was kind of the, which, which, what many would consider uh, a failure, at least business-wise, in music. Probably saved my life. Now then there's the issue of quality of life. Uh, I think my life is pretty quality. Uh, I, I have a lot of successful friendships, you being one of them, you know that are worth more than all the fame and fortune and nice cars and nice houses in the world, you know? You're not the only close friend. There's a lot of people that I'm close with, and that's hell of rewarding and hell of valuable. I, I, I see that in you, and I think it's beautiful. I feel like not only do you have a lot of friends, I feel like your friendships... Oh, don't try to be nice now. <laughs> I'm going to start with the nice. I'm going to end with, with the harsh. But it feels like your friendships are real and that, that like, uh, there's something really beautiful. That, that... And I try, to help, I try to help my friends because my friends have helped me, you know. And, uh, you know, like, uh, one thing with uh, a lot of my drug addict friends, you know, is I noticed that a lot of them, uh, I end up getting a lot of them to call their parents for the first time in 10 years, you know, because... Uh, you know, the, the common uh, thing that, the, that the common thought process of a, of a drug addict is, well, I'm, I'm fucking up. I'm putting my life in the trash can. I don't want to, I'm not going to call my parents and, and say that, you know. They don't want to hear that. And uh, uh, I said that to my, uh, my uncle once. He's like, you know, how, how, you know, you don't talk, call your aunt for so long, you know. And I, I said the same thing to him. And he says, you don't have the right to make that choice. You know, nobody loves you more than that woman. You better call her. And so that's what I tell my drug addict friends. I say, you don't have the right to make that choice. You call your parents. They'll tell you if they don't want to hear it. They'll, they'll hang up on you if they don't, you know. But more than likely, if it's been that many years and you got along with them decently to begin with, you probably should call them. It's interesting that you went into the friendship conversation. Because, so I'm actually going to read what I wrote. I wrote, okay, uh, um, I'd like to talk about friendship. Dizzy has some great friends that have been there for him over the years. What does that mean to him? What part does it play? While it's not helped him get off heroin, perhaps it's helped him stay alive. Oh, it's helped what? me get up a couple times before. You know, they, my friends are helpful. They're encouraging. Are most of your friends addicts? Um, yeah, but not not 90% of them. It's like 60-40 or 55-45. You know, it's pretty close to even. I have friends that uh, maybe smoke pot every day or maybe drink some beers every day, but it's not wrecking their life. So I don't consider them an addict the way that I consider me an addict. I mean, it's not wrecking my life either, but it's, 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 it's me. I, I feel, un I don't feel that I've made, made my potential, you know. I feel like I could do more and, and get late. 
Mm. Yeah. Is that going to happen, though? I don't know, Rich. I don't know. For the friends like myself, you know, that have come to really appreciate who you are and just love the friendship over all these years, there's a part of me that always wants to see you exercise that potential because I care about you. What, what do you tell people like, like me? Like, do just, you know. I'm sorry, please don't choke me. Because <laughs> I'm sure sometimes you, my friends like you want to choke me. No, actually not. It, it's more that I just, I love you and I want, I want to see it like go to the best place for you. And I, and I don't know if that's a reasonable emotion or feeling. Like, maybe I should just be perfectly comfortable with it playing out how it is. Does that make sense? Because I like, like I think I, you should I be comfortable. Home. I mean, do I? I mean, it'd be different if I called you unhappy all the time or something, or or, or always needing something. But which you never do. Well, I have before. I've called you before, needing a, a warm place to go when when I was really really homeless before. You know, I'd like to get a hotel room from facing homelessness or something. But uh, I, I'm just going to interject and say, on a scale of what I think your life is in need of, you 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 rarely ever. You rarely ever ask. I mean, that's always been amazing to me is you'll be in a tent. It'll be in the middle of winter. We'll have a really great chat. And you you don't seem to do that, which is always... Surprising. Probably most other people go, hey, can I get 10 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think people, anybody that's in a really hard spot, it's, you know... Maybe not you in particular, but friends that I have that are like you, I don't want them to... Uh see me coming and go, oh, shit, I don't have 10 bucks. And not talk to me or something, you know? Uh, um, you know, I don't want to associate uh, me with always wanting something or, or you know, because that's not why I'm your friend. That's not why we're friends. Yep. We're friends because I can kick your ass. I We're <laughs> friends because I, I let you think you can kick my ass. That's why we're friends. <laughs> um... <laughs> A lot of people have in their mind like this stair-stepping connection about what homelessness is about. And criminality is always seemingly attached to homelessness, but also drug, drug use. And the, there are so many compassionate people out there. They meet somebody who is uh, addicted and they get to know this person and then they're in this spot. What should that relationship look like for, for compassionate people out in the world, meeting someone that's homeless, that's addicted? Harm reduction will say, you know, our, the person that meets someone that's homeless, that's addicted, their job isn't to try to get that person to go to treatment. Only the person that's addicted can go to treatment, right? To know. Well, I like what they say in treatment and AA, carry the message, not the person. You know, people of all types are... There's ones that are really golden and dear, and there's ones that are absolute pieces of shit. And the problem is, is that they they can all tend to look the same, you know. Of course, uh, you know there there is a reason why somebody is homeless, and they're not always the same reason. But you don't know that person, and do what you can to, uh, you know, don't feel guilty about running a background check. Uh, don't feel guilty about maybe spying on a homeless person that you're having a relationship with a little bit, you know, because you don't want to you know, let them chew into your life and then find out that, that, that that's just what they've been with for. Because there are evil people in the world in all walks of life, you know, and you have to be careful with anybody. And uh, especially somebody with very little to lose, you know. And I, I've certainly, I certainly, um, you know, I, I love our relationship. You know, you've had me to your home. Um, you've had me over for uh, dinner, you know, and I, I could probably come knock on your door uh, more often than I do, which is never. But, you know, if I started coming over every day, that probably wouldn't be cool, you know. And, and, and uh, some people will, you know. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm good, but not everybody's like me. Uh, and there's people gooder than me. Um, just, yeah, be compassionate. Be giving. Don't give to, don't carry the person. I have a friend right now who's, uh, who just got a place. And, uh. Uh, she some she dances for a living when she can, and uh, uh, her excuse right now is uh, she doesn't have a license and she knows I have a little bit of money right now, but I told her you know you come up with half and I'll come up with that you know, 
uh, if a homeless person needs help from you, what are they willing to contribute to get this help to? You know, they, if they're going to just sit around and, and take your money, well, if, if you want to do that, that's okay. That's probably not really helping them out that much unless, I mean, maybe giving them a tent or a sleeping bag can be like that, but for anything as far as them coming up, you know, if you just hand it to them, it's not going to be worth that much to them. they they, they got to put in some effort, you know, I think. You know, I don't necessarily think that I'm better than any homeless people, but I, I, I do think that I'm safer than some, and sometimes, I guess, that does make me feel better. But you always remind me that I don't know what they've been through, you know? I think it's a complicated thing. It is really complicated. Not only because the variabilities in people that are homeless, but also the variabilities in people that are homed. Yeah. They come with their own agenda, their own abilities. There's Even ones like you, and then there's ones that... Uh, you know, that something shitty happened to them with a homeless person and they think every single homeless person is like that or every single drug addict is like that, you know? I put a needle in my body every day that you could trust me with your kids or your grandma. I'd like to say that to the world. <laughs> Even if your grandma dropped a thousand bucks, everything would be fine and safe and where it's supposed to be. Not everybody's like that. I'm not better than anybody. That's just how I am. But everybody, you know, some a lot of people think that anybody who sticks a needle in their body is a certain way, and a lot of people that stick a needle in their body are that way, but not everybody. Yeah, I I wonder if if the fact that someone puts a needle in their arm is a complete non-indicator of who that person really is, right? I mean, because there's a lot of people that live in homes that don't put needles in their arms, and they're pretty scary people. Yeah. Right. So I, yeah. I, I almost feel like uh, the needle in the arm is not really. Well, the thing an is, the thing is, when 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 you get to the point where you're putting a needle in your arm, your whole life tends to be the getting and using and the ways and means to get and use more. Period. I mean, I know drug addicts who are completely inept in any kind of no, normal social situation. You know, I mean, they can barely order food at a McDonald's without. You know, they can't do it without saying fuck and. You know, there's little kids and old people around and stuff, you know, and and they, they can't carry on a conversation that's not about drugs. I mean, there's people like, and that tends to go along with uh, sticking a needle in your arm or holding a meth pipe to your face. It tends to go along with it. it it's not an indicator of who somebody is, but it pulls you when in. you get to that point of it, it's like I say, your whole life is the getting and using in the ways it means to get and use more. And how, how should society... Inter interact with that person like what does that look like that person who's standing in line at mcdonald's and every fourth word is fuck and and they're all they're thinking is drugs and that moment for them like what is the answer there you know free drugs free legal drugs and you know i hate to say it but if, if that causes them to take themselves out well maybe the sooner the better but at least they won't be breaking the law to get their drugs. At least they won't be beating people up or stealing, destroying them, stealing property, you know. Give them the rope. Whatever they do with it, it's their business. I don't know if that's cruel, you know. Seems like if we did that, we would also need to have a bed waiting for any person that wanted a detox. Oh, yeah, yeah, Which yeah. is not the case. Which is not the case, yeah. Have you been into, a, into an organized treatment program before in your life? I have been through an organized treatment. The, uh, when I was on federal probation, they sent me to a very nice treatment center. But there'll still be drugs there, you know. There always is, you know. It's just how serious are you? You know, it doesn't take, for a drug addict, it doesn't take you too long to see who's there uh, getting high and who's not. And, you know, it's, you, you sit down and meet with who you want to, you know. You can sit down and meet with the Joe Cool who's getting high and you're fucking going to walk right into it then. Or you can... Go sit with the nerds or the straight laces that are actually working on it. I guess they're. I guess right now in King County, those blue pills are pretty rampant. I guess there's a lot of drugs in King County. I mean, every time I've gone to King County Jail, there's maybe been somebody who gets in with some drugs, you know. Uh, but I guess it's pretty rampant right now. So I've heard. The little fentanyl blue pills that, yeah. people, that people are smoking. I'm telling yeah. you, every single person that I'm seeing outside is smoking those. At some point in our conversation, they pull out their little aluminum foil and they're and they're burning it and, and you you're, know. Not, you're not hanging out smelling that, are you? That popcorn smell? Uh, it drifts past me. Well, don't let that's fentanyl and it's very potent. If you can smell it, move away, Rex. Yeah. If you smell it, it's getting in you. 
please. Yeah. It's a very powerful drug. It's a very powerful drug. You know, I've smoked a couple of blue pills. I've not smoked more than two in a row or smoked them for, you know, I, they're all right, but I see that everybody who doesn't, then pretty soon the heroin doesn't do it for them anymore, and they, they, they're, they gotta have that fentanyl, and then the next step is a straight fentanyl powder. Which is know? a killer. Which is a killer, Big and, time. and it's even harder to detox. You know, I, it's like I'm not trying to make this worse. It's bad enough already. Dizzy, why are you, why are you, my dad was an alcoholic, and he was what they termed a maintenance alcoholic, right? He just didn't get, didn't get stupid drunk falling on the floor, but he just kind of maintenance drank. Are you a maintenance heroin user? I am. And, and how is it that you can do that in some binge and OD? Like, is there, is that something about your makeup or how do you, how can you not you keep mean, why getting, have I OD'd before? No, why are you not, like you say, like you've said, I've never seen you sloppy, completely whacked out. And is that, do you have a, an ability to say I'm not doing more than this or how, why? How come you can do that and other people can't seem to do that? Um, maybe the hole in my is not so big. Maybe I'm not hurting as much. Because I see those people that get blotto every time, and they're they're they're, they're something. They 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 have to get there. You know, that something's hurting them so bad that they have to get to the edge of death every day. Getting to know and becoming friends with anyone, you begin to care about that person, about their well-being. When your friend is struggling, it pulls at you. You want to help. That's what friends do. Often in these moments, the problem isn't the wanting to help. It is in the how to help. That's the very moment it gets complicated, always. Giving help to anyone is a tricky thing. Giving help to someone that is homeless at times feels a bit like swimming out to someone you love that is drowning. It can be very emotional. There are plenty of reasons folks choose not to give help or to be in service to another. We live in a culture that is defined by the self-made person. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps is ingrained in each of us from very early on. And if too much help is given, there will be those saying you are enabling, preventing that person, that friend, from moving forward. A hand up is seen as being much better than a hand out. Teach a person to fish rather than give a fish. Then there are the unintended consequences of trying to do something good for someone in need. Promises get made that can't be kept. Getting someone a job that they are set up to fail at and then fired. Another layer of trauma introduced. Those ones especially hurt. You wanted to make a difference and instead you made a mess. You didn't understand the depth of the issue or issues at hand. The truth is, helping is a tricky thing. And it's an infinitely worthwhile thing. It's a human journey thing. It's what connects us and binds us together. It has us feeling and acting on our highest and best selves. And the crazy thing is, when we reach out to be of help to someone, often it ends up that we are the ones that benefit the most. This is how I feel about my friendship with Dizzy. The 10 things I listed about Dizzy earlier at the beginning of the episode are all true, but they don't even begin to tell you who Dizzy is, only how he's seen, how he presents to the world now as someone homeless. To know who he is, to know who anyone is and how to interact with them, we have to come closer and first listen. And in the listening, we find where to take the next step. You Know Me Now is produced, written, and edited by Tomas Bernatsky and me, Rex Holbein. We would like to thank Michael Holmes, or Dizzy, as he likes to be called by his friends, for the opportunity to get to know him. 
We also want to give a shout out to a Pacific Northwest punk rock legend, Mike Moen of Neutral Boy, a band out of Bremerton, Washington, whose song you are hearing now. It's a song about a time when Dizzy and Mike would stop at the Salvation Army soup line in downtown Bremerton. Mike told us that to him, Dizzy is one of the most talented people he has ever met. And I agree. We have a Facebook page where you can join the conversation and a website at www.youknowmenow.com where you can see photos of Dizzy and listen to some vintage 1990s recordings from Zeke and Shark Chum as well as see an accompanying video we shot of Dizzy playing some of his favorite tunes just for you. So, yeah, go ahead. The first day of my life I was born. <laughs> the second day of my life they took me home. <laughs> Let's see, my sisters are named Lisa and Michelle. Wait, so Dizzy, I think you, you, you can be that far away, but I think you got to at least be pointing to the oh, mic a gosh. little bit. Dang it, you have to work for this. Remember, Rex, nobody listens to this shit. <laughs> Stay strong, Rex. There's a reason that you're doing this. Okay, so you got to talk a little bit into this. All right, all right. Here, let me, let me, let me rotate my body. Here, put it back this way a little bit. All right. All right, is that good? Is that fine? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty good. Am I at attention enough yet, Commandant? You're, you're getting, you're hitting the bars now, buddy. All right. Where's my phone? Here it is. You can listen in on the friendship. This is a real treat for you, uh, listeners, too. Except I know nobody listens to this crap. <laughs> oh, I can't fucking wait to prove you wrong. You heard him. That's on tape there. Prove me wrong. Wait till I prove me wrong. Right now, there is no mark. It's all a bunch of lies. Don't be looking at your watch. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I, 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 I've never owned a watch. That's even worse that you're faking having a watch so that you can get out of here. Fuck me, hun. So, start from the... Start from when things actually, like when you were feeling your music taking off. I'd rather talk about this Donnie thing right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not like he'd listen to the, be listening to this podcast anyway. Nobody's going to listen to this. What do I care? <laughs> exactly. Rip, cut it. Cut loose. Nobody baby. listens to this crap. <laughs> what, do you, is, what do you think? You're, this, on, you're on E? This, is the same, this isn't the same vein when you accuse me of not being able to find the maple syrup this morning. Is it? Yeah. Well, well, following a theme here. Even you can't do anything right. <laughs> I never have been able to. I hear. Look around. <laughs>